Damon Lindelof likes to take the mundane and embellish it with mystery. His works deal with the ideas of the natural and the supernatural, and this can be explored through the limitless potential of the human brain, where dreams and nightmares are sometimes so vivid it blurs the line between fantasy and reality. In The Leftovers, we see Kevin dissociate himself from the real world, and the writers use a setting to shape who the characters are. When our characters move to Jarden in search of a new life, their past drags along with them, and they soon realise this miracle paradise doesn't help them fight their inner demons. Kevin's run-ins with Patty is stopping him from moving on with his life, and in order to find solace, it requires jumping off into the unknown. He finds a guide in Virgil to help him put away this constant torment once and for all. What unfolds in episode 8 of season 2 is an hour-long barrage of metaphysical ideas and piercing metaphors, scattered around in an otherworldly environment only Damon Lindelof can create. So, how did the writers present this realm? By taking the familiar and dousing it with a layer of the surreal. Kevin navigates through a hotel, over a bridge and down a well, which all seem normal, but it's too normal. They could have gone for superfluous eye candy like other fantastical journeys, but they didn't. That's smart production design. Purgatory is the main illusion here, a place of purification or temporary punishment while you're on a journey to where you need to go, and a hotel serves as a fitting resemblance. They aren't homes where we feel safe and comfortable. You can't find placement and structure during a stay at a hotel, and that's exactly how Kevin feels with his life. That uncertainty lies with Patty. His heart belongs to Nora and sees Patty as a burden to overcome. The bridge he encounters later acts as a transition from one state to another, most likely representing a change in his understanding. She's not a child. Yes, she is. And if you do this, it'll change you. No, this is real. Kevin finally finds a young Patty and ultimately knows that his conscience will be at peace after he's done with her. And it's interesting that the finale plays out in a well, which symbolises life and a place where a healthy community thrives. The catharsis they both reach is touching, which is contrasted by the dinginess at the bottom of the well. The textures of the world feel in line with real life, but the absence of sounds flash out any warmth or connection we usually feel. Kevin rises into this world in a manic daze and is given a choice as he opens the wardrobe. He's presented with four outfits, a pastor, a guilty remnant member, an assassin and a police officer. You can see aspects of his psyche manifest themselves into these costumes, taking his abstract ideas and materialising it in front of him. The priest figure reaches to things outside their own reality and firmly puts their faith in those. Being a guilty remnant member, means you embrace nihilism and reject the hostile world. A police officer outlines the human laws of good and evil, and protecting others from harm. The assassin, on the other hand, actively sets out to destroy things that threaten. His subconscious at this point in the season is out to remove Patty wherever he sees fit, and with those violent tendencies, he becomes an assassin when he dons the suit. It's important to note the sign on the door before he goes to open it. Out of all the choices that were realistic, he picks the assassin. Is it possible that he doesn't know himself like he should? Could it be that the reason he had to choose between the four is because Kevin feels incomplete with his life? Could there possibly be in scenarios where he dons the other costumes, goes along with an entirely different sequence of events and seeks enlightenment? This realm is filled with motifs and symbolism, some auditory as well. The recurring use of Va Pensiero from Nabucco an opera composed by Verdi while he's still grieving the loss of his wife and children, gives that same heightened sense of emotion Kevin goes through. Operatic themes are commonly used during spy films and thrillers, and this episode pays homage to the structure of those. This song is based on Psalm 137, whose last line reads, Happy shall he be, that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones, similar to how Kevin dashes Patty into the well. To further add to the intrigue, Elemental imagery was used to make the world seem more relatable. Kevin rises from the water in the beginning, essentially coming to life in this world. The episode then ends with him rising from earth, which represents newfound stability and groundedness. Fire is present in two scenes, 
one with Kevin Senior and on the bridge to the well. Fire usually suggests strong will and passion, the driving force that Kevin needed throughout his journey. The only instance of air being a highlight is when Kevin helps young Patty, a symbol which serves as a notion of transformation or change, or the key inciting incident that propels the episode forward. Hints to Greek mythology can also be seen, when Virgil tells Kevin to not drink the water at the hotel. The people who did drink the water seem to have forgotten their earthly memories and have changed into something Kevin doesn't recognise. Did you drink the water? I was so thirsty. The underworld of Hades consists of five rivers. The important one will be Lethe, also known as the River of Forgetfulness. The spirits of the dead will come to drink from the river, causing them to completely forget their previous life, enabling them to move on and be reincarnated, according to the Roman poet Virgil. The ominous man in the bridge is loosely braced on Sharon, a fairy man who carries the souls of the deceased into the underworld. These layers of grand illusion, the writers add, give off a vibe that this journey is instrumental into Kevin's revelations. The core of this episode is where Kevin has a sit down with Patty. The character dynamics made them seem like enemies, but this episode is where Kevin finally has some insight into Patty. We find out that her personality stems from the toxic relationship between her and her husband. Her monologue at the bottom of the well allowed her to reach some sort of peace within herself, something she didn't do when she killed herself which finally allows Kevin a sense of understanding and appreciation of her as a person. It also gives the audience some comfort, seeing that she was a person filled with insecurity and doubts before the departure. Like a hand is inside my chest, and it's squeezing my heart tighter and tighter, and he won't let me go until it's over. What was the purpose of Patty being a little girl? Does that come from the fact that Patty liked ruining families while she was in the Guilty Remnant? Or is it mainly due to Patty being such an imposing presence that lessening her to a smaller size would have been manageable for Kevin? The aim of this mission was to remove Patty, and there's no doubt he succeeds, but no matter what Kevin does, there's still a part of him that's attracted to her spirit. There is no Kevin Garvey without Patty Levin. Good to see you, Mr. President. Maybe everything we see in this episode was just Kevin travelling deep into his own subconscious and not in some realm or afterlife, like some sort of dream state. You populate your dreams with references from real life, and with Kevin, he was in a hotel during the sudden departure. He knew Patty and Gladys, and he met Holy Wayne in his final moments, once again in a bathroom. With all the absurdity that happens in the series, is the idea of dying and going to Purgatory 2 insane? or is the idea that Kevin is dreaming that's far more sensible? The basis of the show is simple, how do ordinary, rational people deal with an event so impossible and unimaginable? Applying any form of logic to the craziness is pointless, it simply goes beyond human reasoning. That's the idea the writers took and enlarged it, into this hour long frenzy of absurd meetings and introspective epiphanies. Kevin stops questioning, he lets his surroundings take over him. He isn't fighting, he's merely participating in this madness, taking the screenwriting concept of conflict to another level. This episode is a leap of faith, both figuratively and literally. It's rare nowadays that a TV show dares the audience to feel a type of way and completely upend those emotions by the end. Holy shit! This is Cineframes, thank you for watching.